Our final speaker for today is Dr. Elio Jovasic. Elio is the program leader for protected cropping with the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries based in Townsville, Queensland. And the title of Elio's talk today is Considering Protected Cropping in the Tropics. Thanks, Elio. Thank you, Heidi, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my, my talk will be a little more general, but it will cover many of the aspects that, uh, some of the aspects that Sherry and Len has, have mentioned today. A uh, protected cropping of vegetables and berries in Australia has grown in the past 10 years and is currently estimated at a little over um, 2,300 hectares, depending what type of structure designs you, you include. Uh, producers using protected cropping are mostly located in temperate and, and subtropical regions and in proximity to urban areas. In, in warm climate regions such as those near the, the north of the tropic, tropic, near or north of the Tropic of Capricorn, the segment of the industry using protected cropping is, is quite scattered and relatively small. Um, the largest recent investments have been polytunnels uh, protecting blueberries and, and cucumber. So there are emerging opportunities for protected cropping systems in the in the warm environments, and we have noticed an increase in the number of inquiries and also adoption. Our response to the industry from DAF is to assist uh, current and new investments by developing regional knowledge and advising on technologies and practices uh, adapted for specific farm resource levels and, and business plans. So what we have advantages in the, in the tropics and subtropics, and, and one of the most important ones is that we need minimum energy inputs. Um, uh, the use of fuel for heating uh, together with labor are the principal um, cost of production in, in greenhouse technologies. So in the north, we use very little, probably in subtropical regions in some areas, uh, and in the north, you don't need to provide heating. Um, we have opportunities such as being able to mitigate the effects of climate variability, assuring supply commitments for specific or, or extended periods, and in some cases, year-round production. Uh, we can grow new products, we can remain in current markets and access uh, and develop new markets. Uh, we have some challenges. Uh, sometimes we are very far from, from where the consumer is, so we, we may have aspects of uh, issues of uh, with post-harvest quality and, and shipments, uh, shipment costs, um, but we can improve pest and disease, and we need to improve pest and disease management and make a sustainable use of, of resources. So when we when we engage with stakeholders considering protected cropping, it's the, f the first question is 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 this a set of technologies for you and and the first thing that we discuss is we need to understand well what are the market opportunities we need to identify which are the production uh, constraints uh, that are going to affect yield quality and consistency of supply um, we encourage people to learn from others in the industry to travel observe ask and read all what you can at the beginning um, if they're already using protected cropping, what can be changed to improve those current systems? Or do they really need protected cropping for, for the product that they want to grow? Um, there are many technologies already used around the world, and a lot has been invented, but a lot needs to be adapted to, to our situation, so that's, that's critical. Um, Another thing is what what are the plans or dreams in terms of scales of timelines? It's differ, different if you're going to put a thousand square meters or if you're planning to put a couple of hectares. What are the resources available and what's the patient required to make changes and, and learn? And, and also, in, in many cases, we advise a relatively small and, and, and medium-sized growers to, to try it at a smaller scale and convince themselves. themselves. Uh, very critical is to plan, uh, try, record, get feedback, and modify. That's that's a very critical cycle, and always ask for support. There's a, a private industry levy funds for research, growers associations, and public organizations that can help. 
To address some of these issues <coughs> discussed in the tropics, it, it is good if you can take a look at the national priorities that we have highlighted uh, in the protected cropping strategy. And this is a very recent work. It was released last week, and I put a, a link there where you can you can access it or go to the Protected Cropping Australia website and you'll find the, the document there. These priorities were grouped uh, into value chains, people and technologies, and they were developed after a very large and extensive consultation with industry. In our team and DAF, we have been supporting current and new protected cropping users in the past 10 years. Uh, we work with a variety of crops and production systems, from very low-tech to high-tech systems. Uh, many times we like to use the term fit-for-purpose uh, systems, and, and these ones we combine and adapt technologies and practices uh, to respond objectives in a business plan. We work closely to industry stakeholders to identify cost-effective protected cropping systems through an on-farm through on-farm research and uh, using demonstration plots, tri uh, trials, and extension activities. In the north, protected cropping is relatively a new technology uh, where uh, traditionally you have outdoor uh, farming. So we have worked with a few uh, producers who decided to test protected cropping and follow different step, step, stepwise adoption uh, journeys. These growers and others across the north have, has, have proven that protected uh, cropping can lead to excellent quality and acceptable yields for extended periods. Uh, some have even sent produce samples uh, overseas. If you would like to read more about protected cropping opportunities and technology options uh, for vegetables in the tropics and subtropics, there is a publication online that we prepared in 2018. And the aim of that work was to increase awareness and information about these technologies in the tropics. And there's also an economic analysis uh, using capsicum as a model crop there. Now, coming to some examples of the common inquiries that we get uh, when people are planning investments or thinking about protected cropping in the north. And, and a common one is what type of structure design do I use? And one of the things that you have to keep in mind that evacuation of heat, protection from rain, isolar radiation, uh, wind, and also uh, pest exclusion are, are the typical challenges. Tall structures will create a better environment and will allow to trellis crop vertically, which will lead to longer harvesting periods. However, working at heights will, will require mechanization to reduce labor costs. Reducing risk of damage from cyclones is also something uh, very important to consider. Uh, some designs will allow you to retract or remove the cladding in a very short period of time to save the structure frame in the event of a cyclone. Uh, this, the structures that where you can uh, have um, open or retract the roof or have big uh, roof vents will also provide you a better passive ventilation. The geographical location and specific climate constraints are also going to dictate what structure is most suitable. And here you have some curves that this is this is in the in, in the manual that I just mentioned or in the report that, that I just mentioned and you will have a climatic information of different um, locations in the tropics. Um, these are quite different, even if they are all in the tropics, and you may focus, for example, on protection from rain events and high temperatures and relative humidity in the wet tropics of Queensland or, or Northern Territory, while you will be addressing wind, low relatively, uh, relative humidity, and high solar radiation in places like Carnarvon. Uh, the average changes are seasonal, but there's there's also daily environmental changes that can be mitigated through the use of technologies. Just as an example for cooling, uh, uh, practice through passive ventilation, you can have shades, you can have fogging, uh, you can have your cladding of a, of a white color, and each of these methods are usually effective quite effective at certain periods of the year, but they can be used in combination 
and the selection of the cultivars that we are going to grow uh, in these environments is also critical. So new growers usually focus on traditional vegetable crops, but there are many crops that could benefit from protected cropping in the tropics. These are just some crop examples. Some are common, you already know about them, uh, such as berries and, and ginger. But there are other ones, such as specialty melons, figs, rambutan, uh, vanilla, uh, specialty bananas, dragon fruits, and popos. One crop that loves the heat of the tropics is specialty melons, and we have been growing, uh, we have been um, doing evaluations with this crop for for many years already. Uh, there's a number of there are a number of fruit types normally not grown outdoors, uh, outdoors that have particular visual and eating uh, uh, quality characteristics. Here you can see some Asian types of melons that we evaluated, and and we also sent samples to Asia and. You can also see that in Japan, some of these um, uh, type of melons grown there uh, can attract uh, quite high prices. So uh, the way we grow these crops is we, we trellis them, we prune them in a specific way, and we limit the number of fruits per plant, and we allow fruits to set at specific positions in the plant. By doing this, you can manage irrigation and nutrient supply and increase the quality and reduce the variability in sugar levels and, and in size. And you have an example there of one type with 16 bricks of, of sugar. So now, uh, pests and diseases in protected cropping are probably one of the, the number one uh, factors that are going to terminate a crop in the tropics. Um, so warm environments and and the plants the way we grow plants with high um, nutritional levels uh, favor rapid increase of pest populations and and also uh, the damage can occur uh, very quickly we have regular human presence working with our hands on the crop so and for an extended period so we can spread the pest and the diseases very easily the only way of managing this is by an integrated management approach and the cropping area requires a thorough and very regular uh, monitoring. Uh, the people that carry these activities need, need to have a, a knowledge of the pest, beneficial in, insects and, and diseases. And, and you have to have a, a preventive plan, but that doesn't mean spraying every week. Uh, the structures have to be equipped to try to minimize the entrance of insects. You have to have a hygiene program, and this is before planting, during cropping, and also at the end of the crop. Biological control works well, and there are many examples of successful um, uh, practices in the, in the tropics for several pests. A chemical control may still be needed, and you can use it in spot sprays and direct sprays or selecting a, a specific active ingredients. And also, mo most importantly, having a, a good spray equipment. A crop genetic resistance a, to disease pathogens in many cultivars is also something critical. Just as some examples, there are numerous of practices that can be implemented to minimize the entrance of pests in crops. You see some examples here in, in Queensland and other ones from northern Mexico, where you see that the, the amount of sticky traps that are in, in, in yellow sticky traps that are used in the entrance and pre-entry rooms. If you haven't already, a very good document that will help you design your own crop hygiene is the document uh, by the DPI New South Wales, Keep, Keep It Clean, that was produced by Jeremy Badger Parker. So uh, there are many several pests in the tropics. I'll pick up one example here, uh, broad mites. Another one could be fungus nuts. But broad mites is, is, is very common in the tropics because it's a it's a very tiny mite that loves heat and humidity. So you, you find those two characteristics. It's very difficult to detect because it's very small. They are about 150 microns. And you can see some even crawling on the legs of a white fly there. So broad mites would spread, spread very rapidly through the planting, through planting infested seedlings. Uh, the workers, when they trellis plants, and in, in, in as I mentioned, uh, by forestry uh, through white flies. This is one pest that you want to manage with, with a preventive approach instead of a curative approach. 
and biological control of um, uh, using releases of predatory mites like Neocilius californicus on seedlings when you get the trace uh, it works really well you can even uh, spread them in the in the nursery so at that we have been doing a, a lot of on-farm research and it was only until recently an year and a half ago that the department of agriculture and fisheries invested on a new structure where we can do r d and demonstrations and training in in the dry tropics and this is located in air about 80 kilometers south from townsville and now under the Gatton Smart, uh, Smart Farm Initiative uh, that was launched uh, last week, there's also planning for uh, structures in Gatton in a sub subtropical region. Uh, DPI in Western Australia has one in the desert region in Carnarvon, and you may already know in Chisholm and Richmond, they are also demonstration sites. The structure that we put at air um, uh, had to fit uh, the conditions in, 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 in factors that we have in our climate. So we wanted something with very good ventilation and of course something that we can, uh, uh, where we can retract all the cladding in case of, uh, of a cyclone. We have grown many crops there, capsicums, beans, uh, specialty melons, cucumbers, tomatoes, eggplants, and with with uh, good success. So the last the last uh, things that I wanted to mention is and repeating the a little bit of the first slides. What are the key aspects to support protected cropping uh, businesses um, in the tropics? We have to have an emphasis in, in in an understanding in the value chain, production systems, and what are the available resources. We have to select a structure designing components that will address these key uh, environmental constraints uh, for the specific crop. We have to understand the fundamentals of plant, plant growth and management practices for these environments that many times are different from what we would do in places like Tasmania, Tasmania or, or in, in New Zealand or, or even in, in the South, New South Wales and Virginia also. So, um, very critical is to have a greenhouse and crop hygiene plan. Uh, we need to explore practices to reduce labor costs through mechanization, automation, and even robotics. Uh, we need to use a, a data recording system for production and, and monitoring and evaluation, and being supportive of knowledge exchange, so travel, share, and, and learn with others. And I would like to thank uh, funding organizations that have been supporting our uh, projects and also some key uh, producers and input and service suppliers and numerous growers that have helped us uh, in this journey. Thank you very much.